morning. You're very welcome to worship this morning, whether you're here in person, listening online, or even online sometime in the future. Uh, just before we commence, a uh, couple of matters just to remember. The evening, this evening, there will be a service, uh, uh, be a time of worship at 6 we played a lot of telephone line, uh, as usual. Another address from the uh, Minister of Dromore, the Reverend Philip Dunwoody. And then next Lord's Day, or on Tuesday evening, our time of prayer on the telephone conference service at 8 o'clock. Next Lord's Day morning service, as usual, the time of prayer also next Sabbath morning at 11 o'clock. So please remember these matters. Continue to remember those uh, who, are in pray who are away on holiday, those who have particular needs. Uh, pray for these needs during the week. <clears throat> In Hebrews, we read this text, Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. As we come to worship God, we will be under the discipline of his word. That word is here and proclaimed that we might live for him, to challenge the ungodly and the wicked, and to lift up the believer. And we pray that that is what God will do by his spirit today for whoever would listen in. We're going to commence our worship as we sing from Psalm 23, Psalm 23, uh, the A version. And as the psalm is played, we sing along. The psalmist, this wonderful psalm, uh, is, remember, speaking about the Lord as his own shepherd. What a joy it is for him to know the Lord is my shepherd, no want will I have. What a blessing to the psalmist. Because at the very end of the psalm, because of that commitment and love, he is able to say, I will dwell in the Lord's house always. It is only because he has trusted the Lord as his shepherd, personally, with conviction, that he is able to say he would dwell with the Lord in his house always. There's no conviction, no commitment to Christ. There'll be no dwelling with the Lord always in his house. So we turn uh, to this psalm. Let us sing along as the psalm is played. Psalm 23a, these three stanzas. Let us worship God.
us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we who can say the Lord is my shepherd rejoice in his fatherly shepherding care of our souls. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the confidence it gives us to know that we will be led into the dwelling place of our God, that we will be with him forever. And gracious God, we pray that you will continue to speak to our souls, to lift us up, that we, even as we worship you today, will be encouraged and helped that we might walk in your ways. And Father, we pray for any who need the challenge of your word because they are not right with God. Father, we pray that you will come near in your great love and in your compassionate mercy. Stir up souls that are far from you to seek your face, to cry unto the Lord that his will be done, his name be exalted. So, Lord, bless our worship, we pray, and undertake for us as we enter into this time of fellowship in your word. Through Jesus Christ we ask. Amen. I want to read from that portion in Hebrews chapter 13, sorry, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. I want to turn to Hebrews to chapter 12, and we're going to read from verse uh, one. Hebrews chapter 12 at verse 1, let us hear God's word. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. I'm going to end there at verse 14, and we pray that God will indeed bless to us his own word. Let us again stand as we come before God in prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> 
Lord, we give thanks to you for the word of the gospel, for the call that is issued to our souls. And we who love you, thank you for your great leading. Lord, we come to you sinful. We recognize, O oh God, how little we are in your sight. And we thank you for your leading us to repentance. We thank you for opening up our hearts and granting us the gift of faith in Jesus Christ, for giving us the understanding of what he came to do to suffer and die on the cross that we might have life. We thank you for blessing us with your spirit to lead us in our faith, to follow and serve Christ, to take on board his paths, and we thank you for the knowledge that we are clothed with his righteousness and thereby we are counted holy in your sight. O oh Lord, we marvel at the greatness of the gospel that our sin is covered over in all of your mercies that we might appear before you. And so, Lord, as we continue to call upon you, we cry out that others might come to know your truth. O oh Lord, we see so many around us in their lostness. They are led astray by Satan and his evil devices. They are of the world, thinking that all that they have in this world is enough, and ignorant of the eternity which awaits them. O oh Lord, open the eyes of the ungodly to see the horror of what lies ahead for the ungodly and the glory of what there is for those who come to learn of Jesus and of his word. Father, would you not be pleased even in our day to open your hand in mercy afresh and reveal to people in your love, your goodness, your grace, and all that Christ has done. Father, we do pray that today, even this day as the gospel goes out across the globe, you will be at work. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we are part of the kingdom of God, that we here can be at one with people from whatever nation or country around the world, whether they be in Korea or China or Russia or uh, wherever they may be in the Americas, Lord, we are at one with all who truly call upon your name. We thank you that today you are building your church. And while for us we may at times despair of the, the way in which our own community look uh, not upon God, we rejoice that there are those who even in the fear of their lives turn to Christ and honor him and are ready to shed their blood for him because they come to know he is Lord. We think of those, O oh God, who are persecuted. We think of people in India who run the great risk of being persecuted because they dare to speak in Jesus' name. And the Hindus oppose them and think they're doing a grand thing to rid their their community of Christians. O oh Lord God, may the very stand and faith of your people speak to their persecutors. We think of that also in Islamic countries, North Africa and other places where there are lands where the voice of the believer is only lifted up with fear. Gracious God, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer to O oh God for ourselves, as your people. Lord, we walk in a day of so much people that are far from you. Lift up the light of your countenance, O God. May we know your help to continue in Jesus and to follow him. Bear us up, O God, when we fail you. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us in the midst of our trial, whether that be in bereavement or sickness and weakness. Grant us your favor. And be near to each one connected with this congregation who today needs that special encouragement and grace from yourself. Father, 
We simply commit it all to you in Jesus Christ. Be with us and bear with us in your great love as a father to his children. Through him who is our Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us again turn to the Word of God. We're going to read from Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, and we read from verse 24. This chapter has these parables concerning uh, the kingdom of God. And this morning we're going to look at Matthew chapter 13. We're going to read from verse uh, 24 through to verse 30, the parable of the weeds. Let us hear God's word. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed ears, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up, pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Amen. We pray that God will bless to us his own word. title I've given this address is Mixture in the Church. In these parables, uh, Jesus is speaking about the kingdom of heaven. Those of us who are truly believers look forward, long for that day when we will enter into that place where there will be no sin. We look forward uh, to not having to deal with the people who annoy us and upset us because of their faults or looking upon those who uh, do not walk in the way of God. Maybe even more significantly and importantly in heaven, we look forward to not causing anyone else any difficulty because of our sin, or bringing corruption into the lives of others. However, for the present, we must dwell on earth and yet we are the kingdom of God here on earth. And in the visible church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the church of God. Uh, and yet, how often have you not been disappointed? You look out and see people in the church, and you wonder how well their soul is. The church should be for us the beginning of the peace of heaven, and yet, because of our sins so often, it doesn't match up to what it should be. And as we unite to worship God, to dwell together as God's people, it should be the very savor of heaven and that which is yet to come. However, we know because of our own personal sin how far short that comes. For our minds wander, our thoughts are not where they should be, difficulties arise, and we don't give to God the worship we should. More than that, in regard to the visible church, we are always aware that there could be those among us who are not true believers at all. And that should be a stirring thought and that's really what this parable of the weeds is about. 
It's about mixture in the church, purity in the church, and how to deal with those who are not right with God. It highlights some things that we can learn and hopefully be blessed by today. First of all, we want to consider the sowing of the seed. This is very evident, but it's not just good seed that's sown. We note how the mixture begins because there's an enemy also sowing his seeds. Secondly, we will look at the servants and their desire. They long to bring in a pure crop for, their, for the owner of the field, for the master. And surely that's what Jesus wants, a pure church. And then thirdly, and perhaps the more point of the parable, the separation from God for the weeds and the salvation of God and to God for his glory of the good seed of the wheat. So we're going to begin by thinking about the sowing of the seeds. And the first part of this parable is clear enough and again involves seed sowing. We're familiar at this time of year with harvest, but before too long, the plows will be turning the fields again, and the farmers will be out sowing his seeds, the winter wheat, and so on. We have just last week looked at the four types of soil, and the sower going out to sow in his field. Well, here's more sowing. What has this farmer done? Well, he's prepared his field. He is going out with his good seed. There's nothing wrong with his seed. It's the best seed. It's quality. And he is sowing it with the expectation and anticipation of a good harvest, of a pure and ripe crop at the end of the season, over which he can rejoice. However, as we read, this is not the only sowing that has taken place. Unbeknown to the owner of the field, and to the servants who have labored on his behalf. The enemy comes during the night, and he sows another seed, a seed that is simply weeds. And that's not known. They look out in the morning at the field. It looks just the same as when they had sown it. And after a time, the green shoots of growth begin to come, they see nothing wrong. And to understand this parable, we should recognize that the kind of weeds that were sown were very, very similar to the wheat crop. And we might think that a farmer looking out would immediately, at, at the beginning of growth, say, well, look, where did all these weeds come from? I cleaned the ground, I sprayed it, labored it. Where did these weeds come from? But in this case, the weed that is sown is very similar to the wheat. You can hardly tell the leaves of the shoots apart. It isn't until the ear begins to form that the distinguishing mark appears. Coming from a farming background, I don't know if any of you have ever had to go and pull out wild oats that's one of my memories. Back at home, we had a field of barley, and of course it came, I suppose, to around this time of year, and there was a little patch where we suddenly realized that's not barley. It was growing taller, and of course the ear of the wild oats was different. But until then, we had no idea. I don't know why, or, or simply because my the farmer wanted the, the field to be a pure and good barley crop and didn't want this wild oat in the midst of his grain. But I was sent out to pull out the wild oats. That's not what happens in this parable, but that's what we did. You see, until that point, we looked very similar. You couldn't distinguish. And in fact, if it had been actual oats growing in the field, you might never have noticed. You might never have noticed Maybe until harvest, when the harvester came and realized, look, here's a patch. Those aren't good oats. Look how thin the ear is. There's nothing there. 
That's a wild goat. It's a weed. It's useless. When it's threshed, there's nothing to be gained. And that's, the distinct, that's what happens in the sowing of the weeds here in this parable. And what we need to note is that the sower of that field, God, is sowing to produce a good crop. It represents those who today will be faithful in the church, preaching the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the seed that is cast forth, calling sinners to repentance, calling you to faith, encouraging you in faith, something we will continue to do as long as God enables. To plead with men and women to give their lives to Jesus Christ. But at the same time, we have an enemy, Satan. And what is he doing? He is sowing the weeds. He is the one who comes in our day to people who come to church. And he whispers in their ear, you don't need to worry too much about commitment to Jesus. You're attending worship. That's good enough. Whenever the preacher calls for full commitment, Satan whispers in the ear, well, you're here. You're sitting among God's people. All is fine. Satan will continue to whisper the weed of self-salvation to people, even sitting in the pew. How many people he, has he not deluded by whispering in their ear, well, you've been baptized, so you're okay. Or to some others, well, you actually have attended the prayer meeting once or twice. You're all right. Or even you've come, you've sat at the Lord's table, you've taken the bread and wine, so your soul is okay. That's all that matters. Satan continues to sow the tares, the weeds of dependence upon the church or dependence upon your good works or dependence upon attendance at church as though those things were what really counted. All of those things may have an importance for the true believer, but they are of no value. They are weeds. Satan is whispering the lie in your ear. I wonder today, are there those sitting at home listening to Satan's lie, saying, well, you've listened to the service online. You're good enough. That's all that matters. Friends, it's not. It's a weed. And this is what the person who hears this word needs to understand. Satan is continually sowing the weed. And even for the true believer, does he not sometimes whisper in our ears, you're good enough. Look what you have done. Look how you have given to those missions. Look what you have given to this, that, or the other. You're good enough. If you begin to think like that or to depend upon these things, you have listened to the lie of the enemy. And that's not a good place to be. Satan is always active. And those who are truly committed to Jesus Christ will love him, will attend the church with a full heart commitment. Their souls, their minds will be clearly walking in God's way. But there are those who are hard to distinguish, whose heart has not been rendered to Christ. You're still in attendance, thinking that by going through the outward motions, all is well. I'm seeking to sow the good seed even today and saying to you, don't listen to Satan's whispers, for that's a weed. Within the church, then, we have the good seed and the weeds that are sown. In due time, this crop grew. In due time, the servants, casting their eye day by day, began to notice something wrong. 
And they came into the owner of the field and they said, Master, where did the weeds come from? And so secondly, we need to look at the servant's concern. The servants see the difficulty and they consult with the owner. What should we do? And we can understand their solution. Let's go out and pull out all these weeds. Let's get rid of them because they're going to spoil the harvest. When we come to cut this crop, we'll be have weeds and we'll have wheat and we'll, what a mess it's going to be. A real mixture. We want to see a field of pure barley or wheat or whatever it may. Wheat in this case. And I'm sure the farmers here long when they look out over their field to see the golden heads of wheat or barley or whatever their crop may be without the sight of a weed in it. Only such a crop will of course, probably fetch the best price or be of most use. So the servants are concerned. The owner, however, is very astute, a wise owner. He says to them, no, these roots are deep. And if you pull up the weeds that will unsettle the whole crop, it'll bring disaster. No, just leave it. There will be a day of separation to come. You know, this speaks to us of the actions within the church. Especially it speaks to those of us who are called into the place of leadership and eldership. We look out and sometimes we think, there's someone, they're not walking the way they should. And we would long that they should be changed. And there are times, many times, when we need to bring the word to discipline the lives of the people who are members in the church. These people need to hear the message of God. But wisdom will dictate at times that we're very cautious. God, the wise and astute owner of the field, will say to us, look, they have such deep influence with others. If you unsettle that situation, it may well destroy and be detrimental to others. Now let me make it quite clear. This is not a cop-out. This is only for particular and particular situations. Many times, as officers of the church, the elders will need to act, will need to go to a home and speak to someone if we see deep sin, if we see the broad-leafed sin of, of something in their lives before it gets too big a hold, we need to act. Above all, as I've already said, the preaching of the Word is the start of the disciplinary process. The Bible is very clear in the responsibility for watching over the flock of God to challenge sinful behavior. God has appointed his servants, to go and speak with fatherly care to a wayward child, to restore them to the path of God. And the ultimate sanction, of course, in the discipline of the church is excommunication. And we shudder to think about that. And we would shy away from doing that. That's the true rooting up and pulling out of the weed. That ultimate sac sanction, however, should be used with great care. And thankfully, it is only used seldom. But what's the intention you see all along, even in that ultimate sanction? It is to show that person that they are in the wrong. It is to say to them, you are in sin. And the intention is always to be rest to restored and to bring a person back to the Lord, to bring them to repentance and to faith renewed. Just note, in those grave areas where discipline must be carried out, the facts must be deep 
and very grave indeed. And it would be more detrimental to the church to leave that weed growing than to deal with it with that measure. And all of us who have responsibility do never want to have to go down that path, yet God has given it. It is there for us. Not that we would cut somebody off. Not that we're saying to them, you're useless, but rather we're saying to them, you are in sin, repent, come again refreshed to Jesus, and he will have mercy upon you. In fact, we're showing them where they really stand. So not every matter should be dealt with by the pulling up of the weeds, though there are many sins we do have to pull up and work against before the roots get too deep. But there are those whom we need to deal with gently. And perhaps sometimes we don't even have enough evidence or don't know enough. We may have our suspicions, and what do we do? We say, Lord, we leave it in your care. You are the judge of all the earth. One of the most wonderful things for the spiritual realm is that a weed can become an ear of wheat. That'll never happen, of course, in nature. The farmer might see a weed, well, he wait a long time till it puts on the ear of wheat or barley or whatever. But in the spiritual realm, isn't that what we long for? That those who have listened to Satan's whispers who are, as it were, the weeds who have grown up in the church and and are there, but their hearts are not yet right with God. One of the great joys is to know that that person can and will and could be changed and come to true commitment. In other words, they can be turned into the wheat. And what a joy it has been to hear of one person, a member of a church, who had, I think, even come to the Lord's table, come to admit that they needed to become a Christian and to say, I have become a Christian. I have become a true believer in Jesus Christ because they have recognized that whatever they were depending upon was useless. Their attendance, their times of worship, whatever it may have been, we're all outside of of our really hard commitment. They've come to make a profession and confession of faith in Jesus and be changed. And when we hear of that or see people do that, what we're to do, we're to rejoice and we're to pray that God will make them true to their confession, that God will nurture them, that they might be truly part of the communion, that the true ear of wheat will form and grow and produce spiritual fruit to the glory of God. The servants here in the parable wanted to weed out these weeds. The Lord, however, had another plan, and that brings us to the separation and salvation. Probably, as I've said at the beginning, the thrust of this parable. The wheat and the weeds are allowed to grow together. And then we read, let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first, collect the weeds, and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The crop will come to the day of harvest. The first thing that will be done will be cut down and then all the weeds will be gathered together, bundled together. And they'll be cast into the fire to be burned because there is nothing else for them. They are utterly useless. On the other hand, the wheat will be brought into the barn. Let's just think about those two things, the separation of the weeds. 
the parable indicates what is going to happen. And if we can borrow from the parable that comes later on, the parable of the dragnet, the angels will gather out the wheat. The angels will come. And those who have not had the true faith in Jesus Christ, who have not been rooted in him, whose hearts were never truly God's, will be gathered up and cast in a bundle to be burned. And it should be noted that the God of heaven, the creator, he knows your heart. Friends, you can deceive the leaders of the church. You can deceive even yourself. But you will not deceive the harvester. And he will send his angels. And he will come. They will come. And you'll be lifted out as a weed if you're not right with God. And note what happens. Bundled up and cast into the fire. If you have never repented, if you've depended on the externals, if you've only been play-acting at Christianity, note the end. You will be separated and put into the fire. The prospects for the soul of the unregenerate is indeed the fire of hell. It hardly bears our thinking about it. Those of us who love the Lord, that is something more terrible than we could ever imagine. That those who continue to reject the gospel, who only make a pretense, will be so far from God that they will know nothing of his grace or favor. They will be in the flames of eternal destruction. That's the reality. That's the truth of the matter. We hear people sometimes speak about hell on earth or some other thing being hit. Well, they haven't a clue of the depths and the horrors and the grave nature of what lies ahead for those who are still in their sin. Let me say to each one of you, you need to consider your position. On what does your eternal destiny depend? Could it be that you are relying on simply acting out faith? That you have never really trusted in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins? Well, I urge you, take note of the weeds and of the fire into which they are bundled. What a terrible end. But the good news for you is there is repentance. All who truly seek the Lord, he will come near and he will deal with your soul and forgive your sin. And if you come to true believing faith, calling upon the name of the Lord and are changed, you will become one of his and you'll be gathered into the barn as good seed. What a joy it is. I've spoken of that. That may not happen in the natural world, but in the spiritual realm. Whosoever, whosoever, doesn't matter how young, middle-aged, old, doesn't matter how far you've been from God, Paul was able to say he was the chief of sinners, yet he repented and believed. You can turn. You can come to Christ. But what a word of comfort there is in this parable for those who have, with all their sin and their weariness, rested solely on Jesus. Look what he says. They will be gathered and brought into my barn. Where is that? Quite simply, the parable tells you that if you are resting solely on the Lord Jesus, you will be brought into heaven. You will be there to dwell with God, stored up to him 
a bride beautifully prepared for her husband, for Christ as Lord. And there will be nothing to take away from the wonderful beauty of the people of God. We'll be clothed with his righteousness. And so when God casts his eye over the, the church, the true church, what we call the invisible church, he sees nothing but the beauty of the sun. It is righteous, a glory, magnified and exalted. And he gathers all who are in Christ and dwelling in him. What a joy for the soul of believers to know that we are in him. Yes, we will struggle in maintaining our Christian conviction. We have to deal with Satan's lies and his, uh, the weeds that he would sow in our minds. And sometimes he trips us up. But when we repent and return to Christ, we have the assurance we are his. And heaven is what awaits. What a joy it is for the believer to know doesn't depend upon your communion. doesn't depend on your baptism or your attendance at worship. Though all of those things lead us, direct the soul to Christ. But take them all away and we are left depending only on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And he alone leads us to glory. And on the day of harvest, we will go immediately to be with him. Is that your hope? Is that your assured hope that you look forward to that day? Yes, there are struggles still to go through in this world, but on that day, you will gather to be his. So may we keep sowing the good seed of the gospel. May we continue as God's people to pray that the wicked designs of Satan to have weeds in the church will be thwarted. Indeed, that we will sow such good seed that God in his mercy will call every single one who ever comes through our door to true faith and repentance. May those of us called for oversight and leadership have the wisdom of God to discipline correctly, with tender care, yet with due diligence, show wayward believers that they're, they're sin and bring them back to the main path of Jesus. And may we remember the day of separation only with joy because it will be a day we'll be gathered into his barn and our Savior will make no mistakes. No ear of wheat will fall to the ground no soul trusting in Jesus will be lost. All will be safely gathered in. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. It is a, a word that challenges our souls. Let us rest every individual here listening fully on Jesus that we might not listen to the sinful whisper of Satan who wants us to think that we can do it ourselves, that even attendance at church or listening to a sermon is enough. Father, help us to view that separation that will come and to be on the right side, on the Lord's side, trusting Jesus. That we might be gathered into the barn of the Lord, into heaven, to dwell with our Savior forever to exalt his name, to worship and praise him, and to delight in him. Father, hear our prayer. Lord, we cry out to you for mercy. Lord, have mercy upon any who as yet have not yielded all to Jesus. Father, deal with them. And we long that we would speak to people up and down our town and in and around our district, that there might yet be others who will be challenged and brought out of their sin to know the joy of Christ, the Good Shepherd, the Savior. Father, have mercy, we pray, in these days.
upon our peoples. Through Jesus Christ we ask. Amen. In concluding, we're going to sing from Psalm 2. Psalm 2, stanzas 4 to 8. Here the psalmist uh, speaks, Yet according to my will I have set my king to reign. This psalm reminds us of the way of kings and nations raging against God. But here's the psalmist. I will do his will. I have set him to be my king. And as he goes on to speak, he calls kings to be wise, to take heed. Judges of the earth, give ear. Mingle trembling with your joy, as the Lord you serve with fear. And he calls us, kiss the sun, his wrath to turn, lest you perish in the way. For his anger soon may flare. Blessed him, blessed who in him trust always. Let us stand as we sing together with this psalm. Psalm 2 stands as 4 to 8. Let us praise God together. blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with God's people now and always. Amen. <laughs>